Thanks, uh, Dr. Brett Bennington AM, who is uh, again a specialist in uh, space and cybersecurity policy. He came out of uh, Cisco Systems and before that was an officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. So he has a very broad background in space, he knows everybody. And uh, we are asking him to sum up the day for us. Thank you, Brett. Ladies and gentlemen, where to begin? Maybe a few comments of my own first uh, to set some context and you'll understand my prejudices better. Um, I'm described by some people as a curmudgeon, um, somewhat more practical uh, and pragmatic, not practical, but pragmatic perhaps, than others when it comes to these conversations. Part of my role in defence, one of my last jobs in defence was to be the person who worked with some senior officers to set up what became the uh, defence space office. We didn't have one. We had disorganised groups of men and women in different services and in the defence central part as well. We tried to bring that together uh, initially under the Air Force uh, and that was difficult. I'm also the guy in one sense, and Megan has said this in public, who's sort of responsible for the space agency because I was asked by the Space Industry Association back in 2011-12 to get involved in and then win and then run the uh, International Astronautical Congress or win the bid then run the Congress in Adelaide in 2017. And the success of that Congress was such that Christopher Pine and others in government at the time, A, saw an opportunity to do something uh, that they thought was pretty good to do from a point of view of politicians, the politician logic being quite different to anybody else's. Uh, and secondly, um, I think Pine was terrified that the world's space agency heads were going to turn up in Adelaide and ask the government, so what are you lot doing? And he didn't have an answer. So for us coming from guilt-based societies or society, shaming works. <laughs> and effectively, the, the success of that Congress was an impetus that simply government could not afford. Now, the other point I want to make about this is that for the decade before, through the Space Industry Association and other agencies, it was always blame the government for not being interested. What happened is that actually the industry, such as it was through the association, took responsibility for our future. We organised the conference. We raised the money and we pulled it off. So again, I come back to the comment that was made to the audience earlier today. It's not them, it's us. So stop talking about it's their responsibility, get rid of that pronoun and put in it's I and we and us. And when you make that substitution, you can then again begin then to see your role. The Australian Space Agency, absolutely Australia needs a space agency. And I predicate, that I say that definitely and unequivocally because there are some bits about the agency that I think are des desperately concerning and worrying. Firstly, it's tiny. 23 staff, I think, as of today or tomorrow. Secondly, Megan, who is an inspired choice as the CEO, is part-time. Thirdly, three of the members of the advisory group, it's not even called a board anymore, are either dual nationals or US citizens. Don't we have nine Australians who are competent and capable to advise our own government about space matters? I just think that's a dreadful bloody look and frankly, if I were the Minister for Finance and the Treasurer, the people who ultimately dole out money to this, I'd be saying, how serious are we really 
given what I've just told you. Australia's space history, you've heard Kerry talk about the technology developments and advancements and so on. My PhD focuses on the public policy dimensions of how we got to where we are. And it's by good luck, happenstance and complete serendipity. There is no plan. There has never been a plan. Whether you go back to Madigan in the 1980s, couldn't make the case for space. Barry, uh, Barry Jones was the minister, minister for science. He couldn't make the case to the expenditure review committee, so the money was cut away. Howard got rid of it altogether. There's an unholy truce between CSIRO and the agency. CSIRO somewhat cheekily calls itself and its branding Australia's National Space Science Agency. Now that's just crass and they should be kicked in the bum for it because it's confusing. There's one space agency in the country, fine, CSIRO does good stuff, but let them be somewhat more polite about this and not confuse. The money in space in Australia has been and always will be in the Department of Defence from a government perspective. There's a lot of money coming forward. Some of the money that Megan mentioned today that's coming in through the civil sector, as she can count it that way, is from companies who are positioning themselves to try to win a major defence contract measured in billions coming in four or five years' time for remote sensing capability. So again, let's get real about this and not uh, be too excited about some of this stuff, understand what's happening. America, as we've heard, is our strong ally. At the heart of the Australian alliance, like it or not, critical or not critical, I make no judgment about that here. I simply say that America is our closest ally and at the heart of that is in fact the space relationship. Pine Gap especially, has been, will, ha, is today and will be for a long time to come, the actual long pole, the operational piece in that operational tent, in, in that alliance tent. And of course, we also host for the civil missions, the Tidbin Villa facility near Canberra. And that's to do with our geography, because we are equidistant between Europe, North America, in longitude terms, in the Southern Hemisphere, and that gives us great advantage, including our astronomers, because they can look out from the Southern Hemisphere through the disk of our galaxy, the Milky Way, and see things that some of their brothers and sisters can't see in the Northern Hemisphere. So, I guess I come at this from a pretty hard-nosed perspective in some respects. And maybe, just maybe, and this is to come back to the question that the ethicists and the panel of ethicists asked, um, what's the way out of this? It actually might be what uh, the lawyers as well came to conclude, that maybe it's this sort of mutually assured destruction, the risk that we all lose, or put another way, we have common cause as sovereign states to make sure that things don't get worse and maybe that's the way that we'll ultimately get some element of sanity and regulation around what happens. So they're my prejudices. Let me now try to sum up the day. What an amazing day. Firstly, uh, the governor gave a great speech, whoever wrote that, whether it was her or others, it doesn't matter. I thought it was an excellent introduction to the day. She talked about the conversation being of singular national importance, quoting her. She talked about both the military as well as the non-military applications. She talked about Australia's unique location, which is our differentiator. I was worried that she spoke of us all here as being scientists. So often, we think about space and straight away the default position is 
this is rocket science, this is too hard for me, this is about scientists. Well, as we've heard today, ladies and gentlemen, it's also about ethics, law, morality, politics. The lot is covered and we need more of that engagement. So the challenge to all of the academies, not just the Science Academy, is to actually take an action to think about your academy's role and contribution with regard to the future of Australia in space, humans in space, as we've heard throughout the day. Lisa, what a great opening. Really getting us to think about not just little old Earth in our constellation, but actually where we've all come from and how we're pushing those boundaries further and further back. What a treat to hear that and to hear the work that she and her team of 200 people are doing. Jane Hall then from the uh, Academy of Social Sciences introduced Kerry, Megan, Kim and Adam and they spoke in their various ways about uh, Australia's role and place in space. Kerry making the point that the International Geophysical Year is really where Australia started to cut its teeth in this stuff. Um, upper atmospheric research, and of course in those days we were all worried about Cold War, nuclear weapons, nuclear war, what would that mean for us? Um, very tightly linked in terms of our space ambitions with the United Kingdom. And this is at the time when Australia under Bob Menzies was still trying to think about were we looking to the UK or were we looking to the US. It was a transitional period. I was growing up in the 1950s. I just vaguely remember this and sort of conversations between mum and dad and grandparents and so on about Menzies going to London versus uh, what the United States was doing. But as a little boy of six years old being pretty amazed when Sputnik was launched and I was taken out in a cold Ballarat night to look up and see this thing flash across the sky, not quite understanding, like somebody else said earlier today, what it was that I was seeing, but that didn't matter. So Kerry grounded us in what Australia has done in the past. Megan then came and gave us a quick update, the report card on where the agency's up to, and she explained a little about the uh, 15 million, uh, sorry, the $150 million uh, that is being invested by the Australian government uh, with NASA. Um, that's also an example of policy on the run. The fact that the Prime Minister had to come back to Australia and straight away go from one plane to another to go to Dolby to announce drought funding tells you that there had not been proper consideration in government about the second and third order effects. Basically, $150 buys you a state dinner at the White House. Um, not to say that there won't be some good come out of that in Australia. It's probably going to go to the mining companies in Western Australia. Woodside already has a good relationship with NASA around robotics uh, and automation. Kimberly Clayfield from CSIRO spoke about CSIRO space heritage, which is significant. Uh, and uh, I was a little concerned, though, with one of the quotes. NASA placed its trust in Australia. Why would you not? It seemed to me that that was cultural cringe that was simply not required. So again, there's some confidence to be given to some of our public agencies, I would say. That sort of phrase is not... Is that we don't need to apologise about how good we are. Adam Lewis, terrific talk about Geoscience Australia, particularly focusing on remote sensing and giving us exact examples of the sorts of things that, uh, that is being done by GA, in particular with the DataCube project and how that has uh, application around the world and indeed he is now leading the push of taking the data cube and putting it into, uh, into Africa and into African nations. 
a little bit of conversation in the Q&A around STEM and STEM education. And that's where, and there's no question, we all have an obligation to help in this regard. We are not putting enough students through any of our courses, whether they're in space or other science courses and mathematics courses, we are simply not producing enough men and women in this country who are numerate, uh, who can in fact keep our economy as it is. Challenge to us all. The second session was chaired by Donna Lawler, uh, her favourite person, Stephen, uh, was the first speaker. Stephen, your challenge is to finish on time. <laughs> Never happens because you have so much of interest to tell yourself, let alone us. And we all enjoy that. But uh, anyway, Stephen grounded us in a very intensely word-heavy uh, set of slides, which we can all take home and study at leisure. Um, and I thought that uh, we were, again, blessed that we had him with so much experience and capacity to get to the core of this is not a lawless frontier. But actually, there is a lot of regulation, there is a lot of thought. Countries, sure, they can disobey international law and it's uh, very rarely that they'll be given a, there's no, there's no police force, there's no night watchman to call them up if they behave badly. But when the Chinese did behave badly in 2007 and conducted an, an anti-satellite test that shot down many, uh, shot down one of their own satellites and created a massive debris field, the international opprobrium that the Chinese suffered, they still feel. So there, there are things, there are lines in the sand that Stephen talked about, or in space, that countries really do not wish to cross and dare not cross. And I suspect that the Chinese have learnt a pretty tough lesson out of 2007 and we won't see it repeated soon deliberately. Ben Piggott, terrific talk from Ben. What Ben didn't say or wasn't said is that Ben is actually studying this sort of topic uh, through the University of Sydney and we had him here in that guise. In his real life world, he's a submariner. Um, and, uh, and so he sort of moved from under the sea to thinking about the heavens. But uh, I thought Ben's last slide was a very compelling slide. Uh, it, it, it takes complexity and breaks it down in a way that we can all readily comprehend and understand. Nikki then came and talked to us about space ethics and how there are, are actually questions beyond the technology that we do need to address um, in order that we have a space environment going forward that we can all in benefit from. And that was where the thought of self-interest, common self-interest and the alignment of those might lead ultimately to some sort of mutually assured destruction um, policy as we had during the Cold War that kept people apart and kept the peace to some degree. After lunch, Annie, brilliant uh, little uh, job there, uh, keeping Jonathan, Alison and Keridwin in order. Um, and Jonathan, told us about the big ticket items, which we all know, space and dinosaurs, when you want to get kids excited about anything. But then I thought three wonderful words, mystery, danger, and wonder. And if there's three words to take away and then perhaps apply back into the STEM thing, it would be those three words. How do we, how do we make mathematics mysterious, not necessarily dangerous, but certainly wonderful? Um, uh, if we could figure out some magic around that, uh, we might be in a better place in terms of our future workforce. Ellison, two wonderful definitions that I finally comprehended around archaeology and heritage, both what they are and how they differ and how they relate to each other, and then the relationship back to environmental management. Uh, thank you for, for, for that. Uh, and that very pointed last comment, that we are some of the few 
remaining people on earth who will actually see, relatively speaking, uncluttered night skies. This is something that our grandchildren and certainly their children will simply not experience. That's profound and needs to be thought about. Keridwin, terrific. You're dreaming, they say. <laughs> Naive, irrational, idealistic. Grand plans and then, of course, turned all that on its head with the arrogance and one might say in some respects the ignorance of the Elon Musks and their ilk, the cults that we heard about. But in that, and fast forwarding a little bit, of course, Paul Scully Power paints the picture that that is actually what's most likely to happen. The challenge for this audience is, do you want it to happen? And if you don't, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, I mean, I can sit up here and jaw all day long, but that doesn't help. This is a conversation that we've got to start and put into our communities. And it's a difficult conversation to have because it's not the norm. We're actually starting to challenge people to say, actually, is GDP the number that matters? Or are there other numbers instead? Susan had the responsibility then of the last panel, Bill, Paul Scully Power and Jason. Bill gave numbers of the opportunity. He showed how that opportunity had grown. He showed how we've moved from governments being the principal investors to commercial companies being the principal investors and, in a sense, sets the sort of frame from a financial and a money perspective about where Australia may or may not sit in all this. He talked about lower barriers to entry. I'm going to just intrude here a little bit. I'm at the moment doing some work for the Joint Strike Fighter Project through the Centre for Defence Industry Capability. And when we got involved in this project, and I was on the negotiating team back in 2002 uh, as the security guy, but here I am now being reinvented and brought back into the project to help Australian companies win some of the work share for the Joint Strike Fighter project. This is incredibly difficult to do for two reasons. Firstly, the United States export control laws, the ITAR that some of you will know about, make it very difficult for technology, even for relatively simple and small parts, to be transferred from the United States to Australia or any of the other 13 other nations participating in the JSF project. But secondly, anything that gets built for aeroplanes has to be built, must be built, to the most exacting standards of quality control and assurance. We don't have many companies in Australia that build to that level of standard in a limited production sense. Also, our aerospace industry has been used to supporting a fleet of 70 odd jets in the case of the Air Force's fighter force. Suddenly, we're now preparing our companies to support 4,000 jets worldwide over a 40-year period. So our companies have to think differently. They have to be equipped differently. They have to meet standards that they've never, ever dreamt about. Now, if you think that's hard, ladies and gentlemen, wait till they get to meet NASA. Because that only lifts the bar another order of magnitude or two in terms of quality assurance and quality control. Because, as we know, at the moment at least, it's pretty difficult to fix satellites. Now, you might say mass produced satellites, some of those production standards will reduce. I think that's probably right for the commercial satellites, the planet satellites, for example. But when you're putting people in space, going to the moon, and on to Mars, I can assure you there will be nothing but the best and the most demanding 
quality control and assurance processes put in place for every single piece that goes on to any of those vehicles. And Paul, I'm sure you would prefer that that were the case. So this is not a lay down misere. There are some real challenges. They're good challenges because we've got an opportunity to build some Australian companies that can compete globally. And that's the other point about the Joint Strike Fighter Project, and I think it might apply back into the NASA stuff as well. Just because we've put some money in doesn't mean we're going to get that work share back. We're going to have to demonstrate capability. We're going to then have to bid competitively. So we've got to be right on price and we've got to be right on quality as well. So that's a challenge for our business processes, for our process engineers, for our investors. It goes on and on and on. Paul gave us, in a sense, the counter view to Keridwin, saying, look, I don't, it doesn't really matter what you'd like to be the case, this is what's going to happen. I'm not convinced quite with his uh, sort of the numbers he's produced, but that doesn't matter. They are his numbers and we need to listen to the numbers that he's provided to us because they're well informed. And this of course makes the point that in this room there are diverse views and we have to sort, what, sort out of those diverse views what we seek to take forward and what we don't. And finally, Jason spoke from a defence perspective. Uh, he explained we don't really have a lot of um, defence capability at the moment when it comes certainly to space domain awareness. He pointed out the importance of the US-Australian relationship and he gave us some examples of companies and universities that are doing some pretty amazing stuff uh, with regard to space situational awareness. And my final point in this regard, I'm a director of the Space Junk CRC, the Space Environment Research Centre down at uh, Mount Stromlo. And for those of you who live in Canberra and for those of you who might be visiting, God willing and all being well, sometime in February next year, there will be a very bright yellow laser uh, that you will be able to see as far away as Goulburn um, uh, that we hope to fire uh, towards a couple of objects and at least demonstrate that we can move the orientation of those objects in space using the pressure of laser light. Um, and in the course of that, we've also produced, I think it's now 25 PhDs. And of course, that's the beauty of the CRC program. The laser into space is the cream on the cake, but it's the increase in knowledge and skill that really matters. So summarising five sentences, our geography is our differentiator. We should think about that in everything that we do with regard to space. The environment is rapidly changing, as Bill and Paul and others have pointed out. There are capabilities in Australia. Let's understand and play to those strengths. There is certainly tension between the civil and the defence realms in space and perhaps an even bigger tension emerging between public and private investment in space, as we've heard as well. Finally, let me add my thanks for being firstly invited to be part of this gathering and secondly to you all for coming and thirdly to the Royal Society for putting this on. Thank you very much.